Deuteronomy chapter 12. We'll be looking at those first few verses and a selection from chapter 13, that first four verses in that chapter. The word of the Lord says that you shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their ashram with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of your tribe to put his name to make his habitation there. And there you shall go. And there you shall bring your burnt offering and your sacrifices, your tithes and contributions that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offering, the firstborn of your herd and your flock, and you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your households, and all that you undertake, and in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall not do according to all the things that we are doing here today, which is everyone doing what is right in their own eyes, for you have not yet come to the rest of your inheritance that the Lord your God is giving you. And then chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises amongst you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and that sign or wonder that he tells you, it comes to pass as if he says, Let's go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all of your heart With all of your soul, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice and you shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. Lord, we pray that you would add your blessing to the reading of this word. Father, that we would have ears to hear today what you say to your church, Lord, both corporately and for the individual here today who may not know you. I pray, God, that you would draw them near to you through the avenue and the work of Jesus Christ the one who is struggling in their walk and their faith. I pray, God, that today, Lord, you would build them up, edify them as only you can do. And we pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Worthy of worship. And that's why we're here, isn't it? Because he is worthy of worship, honor and praise and glory. He's worthy of our time and our attention. He's worthy of everything in our lives. The book of the Revelation depicts the early, or the really the culmination of the church laying their crowns at the feet of Jesus. As if any reward we ever receive in this life would be cast back to the feet of Christ in eternal praise and adoration. Today's sermon is entitled Right and Wrong Worship. Right and wrong worship. And we're going to survey some selections of Scripture today from the book of Deuteronomy and we'll expound upon the verses that we read here in your reading with hopes of bringing out some of the larger themes and some of the larger applications that are in the book of Deuteronomy. We've already discussed the importance of worship. We've already discussed the Uh, rightful worship that is when our heart is bent towards right worship to Jesus a couple weeks ago I mentioned the preparation of one's heart how one is to prepare the heart for worship and then how the Holy Spirit fine-tunes our heart for worship see the only true way that a Christ follower will, will really be turned towards rightful worship will be through the work of the Holy Spirit As we read the Word of God and the Word of God goes forward, the Holy Spirit does such a work in our heart that it almost fine-tunes us in areas of our life. That's why I could preach a selection of texts today, and it is applicable across the congregates today. Being that I am a musician and I spent probably the better part of 30 years playing the guitar was my main instrument, There have been few instruments that have given me such headache as a guitar that is equipped with a Floyd Rose tremolo system. Now, there is what that looks like, and I don't know if there's any guitar players. I know there's a few in here, but that tremolo system right there has given me more headache on the guitar than any other instrument 
or any other particular part on an instrument that I know. Now, it is particularly hard for me to explain the mechanics of this piece to you in a sermon this, this morning. But what one does is you put the guitar, the strings on upon the guitar, and you, you use the, um, there's something we have one up here, but yeah, the tuning pegs on this, on a guitar, on the headstock, and you will, you tighten the strings down with the tuning keys on that headstock, and then what you do with a Floyd Rose is you lock it down. And as you lock it down when it's in tune, you use the fine tuners on the very bottom. You see those little round circular black things that stretch across the back part of that tremolo system? Those little teeny pieces right there are what you do to fine tune that instrument to get it locked in. Well, the problem with this particular uh, piece of uh, equipment on a guitar is trying to fine tune that thing to where the intonation is perfect. See the bridge rises and it falls once you begin to tighten and loosen the strings and if it is not set up properly it will go out of tune. But once you get that thing set in, once you get it set in, it stays in tune and it becomes a very good instrument in the hands of the musician. So think of it like this. Think of fine-tuning in that way. That the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives fine-tunes our hearts. But sometimes it takes a lot of, of discipline. It takes a lot of commitment. It takes a lot of setting up, so to speak, on our behalf. And a follower of Jesus needs to be open, needs to be receptive, and needs to be obedient to the work of the Holy Spirit fine-tuning their hearts. No doubt there are some things in our heart and life right now that, that need to be fine-tuned. Whether it's devotion to Him, worship to Him, maybe, maybe we need to get in Scripture more, maybe we need prayer time more, maybe we need to have family prayer more, whatever it might be. But the Lord began to fine-tune your heart to be open and receptive and obedient to the work of the Holy Spirit. It's with our heart that is turned to the Lord Jesus and finally tuned by the pointing of the Holy Spirit that we are people who are alive spiritually. We are alive and our worship will be alive. In fact, Peter says in the letter that bears his name, the first letter, chapter 3 and verse 18, he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So I say that to say this, that wherever the Spirit of God dwells, there is a hunger to know, love, and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember the words from Donald Whitney who said this, Wherever the Holy Spirit dwells, His presence creates a hunger for holiness. I want to do what's right in the eyes of God. I want to be pleasing in the eyes of God. I want to walk according to God's will. So at the beginning of chapter 12, there is this admonition, a reminder to tear down all the idols in life and the things that hinder rightful worship. And I'll talk about a few of those hindrances here in a moment, four hindrances to worship. But in chapter 12, verse 1, there is this admonition, there is this command that there are statutes and rules that you be careful to, to adhere to them. Once the Lord God puts you in the place that He would have you in, you are to live by them daily. And you're going to go into this place and you're going to tear down all the things that hinder you from rightful worship. Whether it would be the idols that are lifted up high or whether it be the shrubbery that was planted around the temple. It's all got to go. It's all got to be torn down. And by the way, this isn't a new concept or a reminder for Israel. This, is, this has been in place ever since the Garden of Eden where the Lord set forth the prohibition, Thou shalt not eat thereof. So yes, there was sin in the Garden of Eden, but we would say it was the sin of idolatry as they, they lifted themselves up to having uh, the... They, they themselves were the main source of all good, right, and wrong, and the knowledge of good and evil. They, made, they placed themselves above God. So yes, all the way in the Garden of Eden, thou shalt not eat thereof. Destroy all the places that have been set up to worship other gods or carved images from the Canaanites that had erected the uh, gods to Beth Shemesh to Beth Peor. They all must come down. Oh, and so when we pick up in our selection of Scripture today, my first challenge is this. 
You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. You, the Lord your God that way. So verse 3 says, You shall tear down the altars and dash to pieces their pillars and burn their uh, ashram with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names out of this place. So what is interesting about these commands here given to the people is to, in really this threefold, if not fourfold fashion, they are to tear down, dash to pieces, burn the idols, uh, and chop down the carved images of those gods. And so all, anything that had any resemblance to false gods or idols or any, any idolatrous paraphernalia, if they had a, a, an idol that was carved out of wood or stone that was on a pedestal and that god or idol was somehow missing from that pedestal, even the pedestals got to go. Even the pedestals got, even the shrubberies got to go. Anything that would pull our attention away from the one true God. Give no occasion for these idols to impact them as did the golden calf. It didn't take very long for the children of Israel to follow this a graven image such as a golden calf. All the way back in Exodus, Exodus chapter 20 through with the giving of the Ten Commandments of God. Their instruction was to erase the images of these false gods from their heart and mind. There were statues that were, that were erected to false gods made of stone. The groves were planted, shrubbery was planted, trees were planted, and they littered the temples where the idols were placed. And Moses would say, they all got to go. I mean, there's a lesson there. Anything in our life, and this has been, this has been preached from this, from this pulpit for, for many a sermon Anything in our heart and mind that takes the place of Jesus, it's got to go. It's got to go. Anything that is tempting us to that place has got to go. Listen to what Moses says in verse 4. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. In what way? In a way that lends itself to idol worship. Now, even if you are worshiping the one true God, Israel, church, even if you are worshiping the one true God, you do not set up a graven image or a carved image that would represent Yahweh because this is the self-existing God of the universe where he approaches Moses and says, I am, I am the self-existing one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is no piece of carved stone or wood that would accurately display Yahweh, the one true God, and to carve any image in this way is utter and pure blasphemy. So the Bible uses this phrase that He is the living God. Uses it 28 times. And to the living God, He has no need to dwell near or next to any inanimate object. Do not worship the Lord your God this way. I often wonder how this command would stack up today. And I am very, very careful of depictions and pictures of Jesus. Very careful. And so we look at like stained glass windows today, very careful. And I believe they can be abstract enough to where they are not trying to represent an accurate depiction of a Savior who is Jewish. The Jesus that I serve is probably not blonde hair and blue eyed. He probably is not um, white in the way that we might think. So we've got to be very careful of the images that we put up to represent Jesus, that, they, that, we're, not, that we're not fallen at the foot of that image, but that we are, it's abstract enough that it's drawing our mind to the true Messiah of Scripture. So how might some things in our time of worship be hindered? What might be some hindrances? What might be some things that hinder us from fully worshiping the Lord Jesus? And most of the applications of us coming together this morning are so much more than just meeting in the, in the church. It's more than just assembling together the body of Christ during a set-aside, set-apart time of worship. It is really our lifestyle of worship in Jesus, but certainly applicable to the corporate worship on Sunday morning or Wednesday night or 
a Sunday night or whenever the church might meet. So here are four things I want to mention that are hindrances to our worship, right and wrong worship. Number one, probably premier on the list is distractions. Distractions. As I said, this is probably the premier hindrance to worship. See, distractions keep our heart and mind from being centered on Jesus. Many times we bring these hindrances and distractions with us when we come in. They are not something that I would not consider organic, meaning they don't come from the natural flow of worship and distract you. Many times you bring them in. I would imagine that probably almost everyone, if not half, who came in the sanctuary this morning, who did not know that we had a wedding yesterday, probably would have said, where's the pulpit? Why is the communion table on a dolly? Why are the steps here? See, we bring things in with us. I just like an old-fashioned pulpit. See, a distraction would be me be more worried about the volume of the instruments of worship or the right note that is hit. Well, that was a sour note. Be more worried about the level of instrument volume or the, whether or not they hit a right note than the theological content of the song. Or whether or not the song was written before 1913. Now, again, these are distractions that we bring and they are not organic from the order of worship. Organic would be like, a distraction to you would be like if I stood up here on a Sunday morning and said something heretical to you. Something that was certainly not things that we believe. And you would say, well, that's not right. That's a distraction, by the way. False teaching is a distraction. Distractions are many if we let them. And I mean, I can go on and on. The things that we bring with us as we come into the house of the Lord. And these would be things that would draw our mind away from truly worshiping the Lord. Secondly, it is a hypercritical mindset. Notice I use the clarification there of hyper. It's okay to have a critical mindset if it is meant towards truth and the pursuit of truth. But hypercritical, a hypercritical mindset, it causes one, just like with distractions, to focus on the small things that have no real eternal value at all. Evangelist Ken Weaver said this. He said it, so I'm going to quote him. He said what I really want to say this morning, so I'm going to quote him. So if you want to get mad at me this morning, get mad at, at Ken Weaver who said this, okay? He said, if you spend time finding fault with the song leader, the announcer, the preacher, those leading prayer, and the Lord's Supper, your worship will be greatly diminished. Sure, people make mistakes. The pitch of a song might be incorrect. They might misquote a verse, misspell a word on the PowerPoint, mispronounce someone's name in the announcements, or use, or use poor grammar in the prayer. We must remember that we are present to worship God and not critique the worship leaders. I will never forget this, talking about misquoting a verse or saying something out of the ordinary. I'll never forget this. This will stay with me until until I see the Lord Jesus. I was preaching from Genesis 3. And the title of the sermon was uh, Christmas According to Genesis. I believe that's what it was called. And so I was supposed to say um, that Jesus is the fruit from the womb as Messiah. So sound it out. I said, like, I, like with conviction, like it, was, like, like it was supposed to be there, I said without missing a, blink, without missing a beat, that Jesus is the fruit of the loom. <laughs> and I'm not talking about mispronouncing something here or there, things like that, but it can be a distraction if, if every time we come to the house of the Lord, all we're doing is looking for mistakes. If all we're doing is looking for something that's wrong, 
our eyes aren't on Jesus if that is if that is our mindset, if that is our heart. Number three, it is impatience that also hinders our worship. Impatience that hinders our worship. We might spend more time worried about what is going on after the service than how accurately Jesus is represented that day or how he is worshipped. And i got to admit to you, this is probably one that I have struggled with often in ministry. Not the actual worship experience itself, but from a, from a pastor's perspective, I might call a special guest preacher to come in and they're preaching and I'm thinking to myself, wow, I've called somebody who's going to go over 12 o'clock today. Uh, they're a little long-winded. And I, and I, try, to, I try, to, uh, try to think rightly about this and, and think, you know, um, this is for the cause of the gospel. And, and, I, shouldn't, and, I, and I shouldn't be struggling with this, uh, with this impatience because if the Lord is going to do a work, sometimes he's got to move me out the way and he's got to do a work. I, I struggle with this. Often, whether the, whether the songs or the sermon will stretch too long, whether not somebody's going to get up because they're displeased with what, I, with what I say or what I, how I present the word, or we might be ringing too much scripture for that day. Hey, you might be sitting there this morning itching in your seat, ready to go, ready to go home. And I don't know if that's you or not, but I believe that that is a hindrance to worship. Impatience, impatience. I imagine many of us would be very out of place in the early church the Bible tells us that the church met daily. They met almost every day until persecution came. They, they met in homes almost every single day. Hearing the word, hearing the teaching, people were being saved, people were being baptized. Number four, a misrepresentation or false teaching. This becomes a distraction too. See, if one is representing Jesus inaccurately, how can my worship be accurate? This is why we spend so much time trying to rightly handle the word of truth. That's why Moses spent so much time teaching the Israelites coming through the wilderness. Obey the commands of God. He wants what is good for you. He wants you to flourish. That's why we spend so much time trying to handle the word of truth rather than hyperinflating funny stories or funny jokes. And there's a place for that. But listen, you don't want to hear me all day up here talking funny jokes in my life stories. You don't want to hear that. Hopefully you don't. My life was kind of boring growing up. My brother and I would fight with sticks and twigs and everything in the yard. Our life isn't very exciting all that much. You don't want to hear my stories. Hopefully you've come to hear about God's Word. You want to hear God's Word. You want to hear how to grow. So if the point was this, that you shall not worship the Lord your God in this way, in an idolatrous fashion, or things that are hindrances, demonstrating wrong, wrong for worship, is it truly worship at all? If my mind is so consumed about these other things and trappings of the order of service, am I truly worshiping? At the end of the day, here's the question I want you to think about. As you leave, something to think about. Was our time, was my time in worship today more about the worshiper or was it about the object of worship? I'll never forget reading this example from Francis Chan. Francis Chan, he tells of a story about a, a young lady who came out after, after worship and, and said to him, he, she said, you know what, uh, I really didn't like the, uh, the worship service today. She said, I really didn't like the worship service today. And he said, well, that's okay. We weren't worshiping you. Now here's a good piece of advice, okay, on distractions and removing idols out of our heart and mind to set Jesus in his rightful place. Here's a good piece of advice, and this has helped me. You will get more out of worship. You will get more out of worship if you make it all about Jesus than if you were to make it just a little bit about you. Does that make sense? You will get more out of Jesus if you make it all about Him. You get more out of worship if you make it all about Him. If you were to just make it a little bit about yourself. Then from verse 5 all the way through the ending of the book, he says, You shall seek the place of the Lord your God. You will choose this habitation... In the name and make this his habitation, there you will go. 
You'll bring your offering, your tithes, your sacrifices. You'll even eat before the Lord your God. You'll rejoice before the Lord God. Your household will eat a meal in the name of Jesus. You ever hear your kids say, God is great, God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Hey, that is your child as small as that prayer might be, recognizing that God is even sovereign over the meal that you eat. And in verse 8, that you shall do, you shall not do according to all that we are here doing here today. That is, everyone doing whatever is right in his own eyes. And therein is another distraction to worship, everyone doing what they think is right in their own eyes. We can get in preference of music or preference of of Bible translation, we get a, there's a million different de- uh, ways that we can go with this. But how does this translate in today's vernacular? Preference-driven worship instead of Christ-driven worship. Now, can the two merge? Certainly. Can preference and can rightful worship merge? How do they merge? They merge when my will seeks to please God. Seeks to please God. So, listen, I, I've got to say this. I like all genres of music, in, at least I, I, even as we incorporate it into worship. Okay, I like, I like many different genres, and uh, I do not like rap, and I'm not a country fan, okay? So, I'm, that's me. Uh, I'm not going to incorporate rap or country. You'll never see hip-hop dancers up here during worship. That's me, okay? That's my preference. And we can utilize many different genres of music. I like rock. I like, uh, some, I like some, some uh, metal. I, I mean, I like all types of different styles of music. But I also know that this is a place where there are certain preferences that we enjoy in worship. But here's the thing. If those words and those songs are theologically robust, I'm all for it. If they can represent God and Jesus in a worshipful way, all power to the worshiper. And if you were to follow through the rest of the chapter, chapter 12, you'll find in verses 8 through 11 that the people are to be joyful in their religious celebrations. As the Bible tells us, I rejoice, I was happy when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. When we approach worship, we must approach with joy. Knowing that, hey, I'm going to come here today and I'm going to get something out of the singing. I'm going to get something out of the word. I'm going to get something out of the communion. I'm going to get something uh, out of, of, um, of fellowshipping. But more, but more importantly, I'm going to give God all my attention. In verse 12, the offering must be brought to the place where God has appointed. There's tithes that are given from the food, the wine, the things that are be eaten in the place that God shall choose. All of this shows that God is a God of order. God expects worship, and He does expect order. So, you know, as I mentioned the hip-hop dancers, I don't know if that would definitely be in order. The Levite, he says, must not be abandoned, reminding us all of God's people having a place at the table of worship. If you're a child of God, you have a place at the table for worship. Verse 19, all the clean beasts will be eaten, blood will be poured out, it says. There will be vows, burnt offerings that are given. There are precepts that are to be obeyed. There is a caution against abominations. There's a, a, an admonition that nothing will be added to or diminished from the word of God. That declaration stands true today. Verse 32, everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take away from it. Now, we cannot add to any of the commands of in Scripture, whether they be the Ten Commandments. We can't add to the civil commands. We can't add to the ceremonial uh, law. We can't add to any of that. But my Bible tells me that Jesus came to fulfill or to complete the law. So if I'm to love my neighbor as myself, guess who gives me the ability to love my neighbor as myself? Well, the work of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. But we are not to add anything to God's Word. Secondly, walk carefully after the Lord your God. Walk carefully after the Lord your God. We could also translate this as walking close. It carries the command to draw near to Jesus. 
ultimately, and he will draw near to you. Now, this warning can be first seen in Deuteronomy 13, and then, well, really a warning, and then in chapter 18. So chapter 13, we see it first here, and then chapter 18 that says, If the words of the prophet do not come to pass, do not listen to them, for they are a false prophet. Now, here are the words from Moses given to him by the Lord God. Now, these are the first verses that we read in chapter 13. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises amongst you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and that sign or wonder that he tells you, if it comes to pass, and it, like he says, but then he says, let's go after the gods which you have not known and let us serve them, then you shall not listen to that words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you whether you love the Lord with all of your heart and with all of your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him or worship and keep His commandments, obey His voice, and you shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. Sounds like we can transplant many of these verses, pick it up and land them right in the New Covenant, the New Testament. So here again is this right and wrong element of worship. And, and once again, it points back to the clear and right dividing of the Word of God through preaching, through teaching, through small group, or whatever it might be. In your quiet time, it's important to rightly handle the Word of truth. Now, the warning is quite serious. It's a serious warning. And here's the warning. If anyone preaches anything that is contrary to what the Lord has spoken, do not listen to this person. I remember somebody asked me not long ago, he said, well, who are the prophets today? Who are the prophets today? Well, the prophets today is the proclaimer of truth. When a person stands to preach the Word of God, to decipher the Word of God, expound on the Word of God, they are saying what God has said, and they themselves are a prophet in that moment. So they are not speaking things such as, the Lord told me to tell you that you're going to get a lot of money in the coming days. The Lord told me to tell you you're going to get that brand new car that you laid your hands on. That is not the type of foretelling and forthtelling that the Bible speaks of as a prophet of God. And the warning again, if God has not said it, and this person proclaims it, do not listen to this person. Whether they give prophecy by dream or by words, if it leads one to stray from God to chase after other gods, do not listen to them. Now, and by the way, it says that if this prophecy had come to pass, meaning that they could have deceived people. Do you know that the, in the uh, umbrella of Christendom today, there are many false prophets? All you have to do, and I'll say this, all you have to do is turn on TBN. All you have to do is turn on television to some late night TV evangelist. And they might come to pass whatever they say. But then they might say, well, look, we're going to chase this other thing. And today's vernacular, in today's time, what are they chasing? Hey, money. American dream. If it leads someone to stray from God and chase after other things, other idols do not listen to him. And the way that one discerns a false prophet from a man or a woman of God is by the word of God. So Moses gives this warning to the people that has echoed through time itself. It says, walk after the Lord, hold fast, or clinch a hold to the Lord. Don't let go of him. You know the story in the gospel of the, women, the woman grabbing the hem of Jesus' garment, gripping a hold of the garment, and listen, I say is Christ, we, need, we need to grab a hold of all of Christ as we can. Clinch him, hold tight to him, hold fast to him. There are people alive today that will try to lead you away from fidelity to Jesus. Sometimes it is subtle, sometimes it is blatant, but do not fall for the traps of the enemy. And in today's umbrella of Christendom, there is a movement called progressive Christianity. Progressive Christianity today will teach you that the Word of God, just like the liberals did back in, the, back in uh, classic, theolo um, uh, classic theological liberalism, that would teach you that the Bible is nothing but myths. 
It would teach you that you can just live your life however you want, that there is no answer for sin, that Jesus died on the cross for all. And what I mean by that in some universal way. So there are people in the world today that will try to lead you astray by tickling your ears. Paul, in the second uh, letter to Timothy, describes this time, and I believe it describes our time to a T as well. Listen to this third warning. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, he says, I charge you in the presence of God, because Paul is an apostle, I charge you in the presence of God and of, the, and of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but they will have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They'll call preachers and teachers who will say things that will inflate their ego, that will tell them the things that they want to hear, that will give them a free will to sin. Verse 4 says, And they will turn away from listening to truth, and they'll wander off into myths. Underline myths, highlight myths, as I mentioned, progressive Christianity. The new apostolic movement. And by the way, a false teacher or a prophet is not someone just who's on TV teaching this name it, claim it theology or predicting that the world is coming to an end on a certain day. And not just the Jesse Duplantis of the world who claim a, a, that God is going to give them a jet or the Creflo Dollars who says that God is going to give them a $56 million jet. He said, I, I, want a, I want a 56, I'm believing God on a $56 million jet. I can go preach the gospel. And I've listened to his sermons, and I've yet to hear the gospel. Other than if you believe that God is going to give you a million dollars, he's going to give it to you. That's not the gospel. In fact, that's anti gospel. And it's not just on TV. Not just those who are predicting the world will come to an end on a certain day like, like Harold Camping did not long ago, trying to predict the rapture. A false prophet today is anyone who claims to speak for the Lord, but is teaching something that God never said or taught. And I get it, a person might say something in passing. They might say something to the effect of the Fruit of the loom instead of fruit of the womb. They might say something like that that was not on purpose. But that is strictly different than someone that is speaking this per perpetual blasphemies. And I would say that I have revised some of my own teachings and beliefs over the ages. But when a person abandons the core doctrine, the core order, first order doctrine, they are a false teacher. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? If you abandon that Christ is the only way to salvation, that belief in His work on the cross, His resurrection, is the only way, the only way to salvation. It is not by works, lest any man should boast. If you teach anything other, other than the core doctrine of salvation in Jesus alone, if you are not in false teaching, you are teetering on the line. It doesn't matter how full the church is. It doesn't matter how full the church is. It doesn't matter how charismatic or how energetic that the pastor might seem. The pastor might come down on the stage, which I would call it a stage, might come down on the stage on a zip cord. You ever see that video? The pastor come in on a, on a zip cord. Come to preach. Got stuck about got stuck about halfway on a zip cord. Doesn't matter if the pastor's swinging from the chandeliers. It doesn't. It doesn't matter if they're spitting and sputtering from the from the pulpit. If they are not teaching, listen. If they are not teaching the supremacy, the sufficiency, and the exclusivity of Jesus, they are a false teacher. And do not listen to them. The same warning that Moses gives here is helpful. But praise be 
to God that we have the indwelt Holy Spirit and the Word of God that directs us. Now, how does this line up to worship? How does this line up to worship, right and wrong worship? Jesus said to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, discerning what is right and wrong, making the truth of Jesus the centerpiece of your worship. Again, the question is, when we leave here today, will we say that our worship was more about the worshiper or is it more about the object of our worship? The ending of this particular chapter, we find that the, from verses 7 and 8, that the world is full of, of distractions and idols and people who would try to seduce you. The Bible speaks of the punishments of those folks, cities that have been twisted from the pure worship of the Lord God from verses 9 to 11. And then to find out how the city and how those false prophets would be treated. And I would say, thank God for the grace of God today because the Bible in Deuteronomy would say that you put those inhabitants, those people who seduce others, you put them to the sword. I'm thankful that we have the grace of God today and that we look towards Jesus' return for the end and rightful judgment. All the spoils of the city would be destroyed in verse 16. And the promises to those who disobey or to obey those directions we find mapped out in 17 and 18. And really these are verses, they, they are the last of the admonition to keep the commandments before we actually go into reading the actual commandments themselves. So it's actually like the practice and then, and then putting it into practice. What we'll find is theory and practice. Reminding them of the laws and then a reiteration of the extent and the exact laws himself beginning in chapter 14. And Lord, if the Lord wills, he doesn't return, we'll jump into that next week. So in closing, number one, we are not to worship the Lord in the way of the pagan or of the world with the trappings of idolatry. We worship the Lord Jesus we worship the Lord in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When we worship God, we worship Him in, in a triune fashion. We worship God the Father, we worship the Son, and we worship the Holy Spirit. Not with idols, not with distractions, not with supercritical mindset, not with impatience or with misrepresentations, but with truth and our minds rightly directed to him. Secondly, beware of false prophets and run from their teachings. Now, I said that I would leave you with the words of the Lord Jesus, and I saved these to the very end. So let's read from John chapter 4, verse 23, and then we will move into a time of communion around the Lord's table. Jesus said this to the woman at the well, well known verse. The contention was what is the right place to worship? Samaria or in Jerusalem. Jesus said this, The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. But the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. The Father is seeking worshipers in this way who are worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Seeking such people to worship Him in that way. Is that you? Is that you today? Let's pray.